Boy, oh boy, what a day it's been. It has been historic. Let's get straight to it. Scott Walter, mechanical and aerospace engineer, and Ozan Bellick, self-proclaimed as, what is it? The space aerospace geek, space nerd. Yeah. Aerospace nerd, yes. There you <laughs> what a day it's been. Let's, let's break this down. That I mean, was this amazing. This witness history. Sure did. That, that was absolutely amazing. I know the first question you're going to ask, so I'm going to go ahead and answer it. And go for that, it. You know, was it a success? Okay. Now, if this was any other rocket, any other rocket, it would have been considered a complete success because with any other rocket, the first stage ends up in the water. Yeah. The second stage goes up and does whatever it wants to, and either it stays in orbit if it wants to, or it just burns up. So basically, if you look at it from the standpoint of measuring against any other rocket, it's a hundred percent success. Now, from the standpoint of SpaceX, they let's say they missed a couple of things they would like to see and it will kind of go down there and in, in one step after another, but let's start at the beginning. What do you think goes on? Yeah. And I, I just want to add like one little caveat, which is that uh, most launch vehicles, you do want to have that uh, second burn after, after Seco, which mm -hmm. you know, they didn't, uh, they weren't able to do for whatever reason. Uh, speculation is that uh, they didn't have ad attitude control. And so they didn't relight. Um, we do have examples of rockets that, uh, you know, don't have that relight of the upper stage, like Long March 5B, and then they just came, you know, deploy their payload and then uh, come down wherever. Right. But ideally, you want it, you want to be able to relight the upper stage one or two more times after you have orbital insertion. So it's like, you know, I'd say like 99% of the way to a flight-proven launch vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Expendable vehicle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we, we, we Scott and I were just talking uh, offline about that. Uh, we'll get into that uh, a little later. But so if uh, on, a, on a scale of one to ten, Scott, how successful? What 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 grade would you give it? Okay. Uh, again, if if you're looking at versus an expendable, I guess I'd go ninety nine percent because you're you're right about the the, the relight there. If it was just about being able to open up a payload bay door and shove a few things out, which they potentially could have. And I'm sure they could have gone in a completely different orbit if they wanted to. But the whole idea is to make sure that was one that you were able to come back down on. That, yeah. you know, it's it's very close. So you have to give it, you know, almost a 10 versus an expendable. But from the standpoint of what everything that SpaceX want to do, it's probably close to 90%. They didn't expect yeah. the reentry vehicle to make it all the way down. It probably rutted a yeah. bit sooner than they wanted. And then there was a disappointment on the first stage that the, um, uh, the the landing burn didn't quite go the way they want. And so we'll probably have to break that down and understand what it is. But they came pretty close. I mean, they, they're able to to bring it on down. I'm assuming that the velocities and, and where they wanted to be was where at that point. It's just that they weren't able to stick the landing or in this case, you know, stick the dive because they were just going straight into the water. Yeah. And that connection, that feed. Thanks to Starlink, how amazing was that? Right through, uh, right through that plasma. Oh my <laughs> God, I mm -hmm. never seen something like that. That's crazy. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is, and and I, I wonder if it's because you know Starlink was being used there, and that they, you know, whether some of the problem might be. I think the plasma sheath comes around, and maybe if your antennas are trying to beam something down to Earth, they can't get through it, and maybe there's yeah. kind of like an opening up above that allowed them to hit it. I don't think they were using lasers or anything like that. I'm pretty sure they were just using mm. normal kind of um, uh, radio frequency bands. But still, uh, yeah. I mean, otherwise, how else are we getting that live footage? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Ozan, rating out of a 10. I mean, I, I agree with Scott there. I, I think that's uh, spot on. Close to 10 for an expendable launch vehicle. You know, if, if I have to... Uh, give it a number. I might say nine, just because it wasn't perfect because of because of that relight issue. Um, yeah. And there are some questions about the the payload uh, door uh, as well. But that's I mean it it did open, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. It was just a question of did it you know after it closed did it stay closed? 
uh, there's there's a little bit of a uh, there's some yeah, and if, and if you're expendable, you don't care. But, yeah, exactly. You know, you, exactly. There's more important that the thing yeah. opens up so you can get the stuff out. That's right. So it's really it's really just a relight um, that was yeah. the attitude control and relight. Um, so yeah, somewhere between nine and ten as a launch vehicle. As mm -hmm. as far as their objectives for this test, yeah, somewhere between eight and nine seems about right. Uh, one other thing that I, I I heard speculation on was whether the boost back burn. So, uh, completed successfully and that's something that i need to go back and and double check yeah maybe, um, maybe yeah i think that, look at it now so it it, yeah. it would be great to let's let's go right to t minus 10 seconds and just really see what's going on here um is we, we can see that the, the launch looks like it's spectacular here so look we're going to want to look at the engine light sequence see how that lights up and then the outer ring kind of completes itself it looks like everything there was perfect they stay lit and then what I want you to see is the speed when it clears the tower. Yeah. And, okay, it's over 100 kilometers per hour. Look at that point. It's nearly 200 kilometers per hour. Yeah. I, so I haven't done the calculations, but, how, I mean, it's definitely probably 1.5 Gs at least. Would you think? That's a lot of acceleration in, in a short order of time there. Uh, so we're at T, T plus 12. Uh, when was the when was takeoff? Uh, was it around two seconds, three seconds? Hang on, let me just follow back. And I think it was just two seconds. Two seconds. So, or maybe one and uh, yeah. That, okay. That thing got up to speed really quick because the, the other times it was lethargic on the times it, to cross the tower, and it's going out of there. And then you can see how how confident the whole thing looks. You know, there's really Okay, we got a little bit of debris there, but really not a whole lot coming yeah. around. I think it's two seconds, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So in two 10 seconds, seconds at 1.5 G, I would expect it to get to, you know, 50 meters per second vertical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it was average 1.5 uh, G. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so average speed of about 25 meters. So it should be about 250 uh, meters. Okay. Uh, and I think that the... Uh, Trying to think, I think the tower might be like a, around 140 meters. Yeah, I, I think. think so. About 100. So, so it might be that it has like a little bit of a ramp up because it does seem yeah. to accelerate pretty solidly. But I think yes. it's, you know after takeoff, it might have a little bit of a ramp up before it. Yep, and it's yeah. it's just going, and then after this point, it starts accelerating. It seems like even more that the speed starts climbing really well here, and then yeah. we yeah. start hitting a lot of these. You know altitude marks very quickly compared to the, the previous two flights i mean the first flight it took forever to, to really get appreciable attitude altitude and right now we're already at a kilometer yeah. you know it's yeah. just just going and going and going on up there so um that this was really quite the hot impressive. staging yeah and the hot staging just goes perfect it'd be nice yeah. to see a couple other views of that so if we go back to hot staging again it seems like the engines all relit like they were supposed to so that mm -hmm. was impressive. So when we get to the hot staging, I didn't see all the engine because there was so much going on, and so much excitement. It's been very hard to, to look at it in the details. But when we get to the hot staging, okay, we get the three engines that are there like they're supposed to be. They're staying fine. We get the hot staging pushback, and then those engines light up. And this was a big concern the last time. And yeah. boom, 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 boom. They're up. Yeah. And... What are your thoughts if, on that, Ozan? I mean, last time there was I, I a would love to see a view from the bottom of the, yeah. if, if we could. That that would yeah. be, be awesome. Oh, there's going to be a lot of them out there. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. everyday astronauts got a bunch of that. He'll be releasing oh, yeah. in the next yeah. week. Um, yeah. And I'm sure there's SpaceX has got to have a lot that I, I, hopefully they're going to be posting a lot of that things so when they put it out. Yeah. I'm, you know what? I'm going to try and, and pull up the entire feed so, if I can. Uh, so, what was the concern? Yeah. What, what were the concerns on the boost back burn that it, it wasn't? Yeah, so neat? the flip was fine. Uh, some I, I saw some people saying that the uh, yeah the boost back burn wasn't complete uh, and that it shut off unevenly. Now I did also notice in the feed that uh, if I remember correctly, the, the booster engine after at the end of the boost back burn, uh, you know, one side shut off before the other. Um, there was like a you know, fraction of a second delay, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but. You but know, the question I, it wasn't is, clear is, how much that was, we, is that intentional? We, well, the other thing is how much you can trust that dashboard. Yes, you, yeah. 
yeah, we know I, that I, the dashboard yeah. was out of sync and on previous Always out of sync. Can't it's the trust the dashboard, yeah. but like also if even if the dashboard was accurate, it could have been intentional to induce a little bit of a rotation because it's yeah. going to be coming, you know, it's going to be coming in tail first. So why not? Um, yeah. yeah, that you might go ahead and do that. And the, plan. the only way we'll know is we need to be able to see the tail section yeah. from the ground and we can see which engines are actually lit, right? And which one not. Yeah. And then the other thing that I need to check is the is the velocity, um, mm -hmm. which it's a little bit hard to deduce from uh, the telemetry that they give us because it's basically. Um, magnitude of the velocity vector not not you know we don't get directions but it's not, not the components components velocity. Yeah. yeah uh yeah. so since it's going up when you do the boost back uh, burn it's you know what you're expecting to see is that it goes down to some value that is basically its vertical component and then um and, and then it builds to back return up. the other way exactly yeah now it, it it's a lot okay i think it's velocity went down but because its <laughs> altitudes continued to go up yeah, so it it went past the von Karman line, so it went up quite. Yeah, a bit. yeah, yeah. So and and at yeah. that point, it's it's all it's dropping back down to a, a sort of then then you're getting down to minimal horizontal velocity. Um, right. Oh, all right. So the, your, your, your velocity in magnitude is getting yeah. down to your horizontal velocity. Yeah, and so the the question is whether they sort of hit the touchdown mark that they wanted to, whether they were yeah. able to get that control. What surprised yeah. me is they don't have a reentry burn. Do you know why? Is it because it's not up? doesn't go up that high it's not coming down that hot um i think that it's because it's a steel skin uh with more okay. of an engine shroud and uh okay. the raptors might also be a little bit like i think the raptors are better protected um mm -hmm. and maybe uh uh actually i don't know if the if the construction of the nozzle is is more uh, heat resistant but i think that they are a little bit the the, the other the, the piping around the uh, the engine yes. is a little better protected. Yeah, everything else and, is better. And then you you've got you've got the steel skin. Right. Um, and the so nozzles it, are designed it can to take handle higher anyway. temperature. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know it's it's a question of how much the grid fins are able to right. also help slow down the vehicles for the reentry heating. Um, so I was trying to look as close to them as possible to see if you saw any heating on the grid fins. Did you notice any when it when it was coming down? I didn't notice any. I, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be—I wouldn't really be expecting them to be glowing in, especially in daylight. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's very hard to tell. But but this—that just happened so quick in the hot staging. Yeah, uh, it was just very hard to tell. Um, you know, it's like man, it was just over. <laughs> it just worked. Yeah, yeah that was just, yeah. that was awesome. Like, I, 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 I didn't mean, have a chance to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, and of course, I was hoping to be able to see this launch. Uh, you know, maybe from Florida. I was thinking, well. Uh -huh. But it's it's in the daylight, and then the other thing that you realize there when you looked at that, these are actually going to be very difficult launches to watch. You get a little bit of a contrail there, but that's about all you might see far away. Is you might see this little contrail, but then when it gets up high enough, you don't get a contrail anymore, and that's it. And you right. are just going to be looking for that glow. When yeah. a Falcon Nine is going up there because it's burning kerosene, which is very carbon rich, and it has a, a lot of soot going out of it you get this very long, bright orange tail mm -hmm. that is so big, you can't miss it. But this thing is just going to be this little bright dot and you better be looking in the right place and hope the sun isn't in that same direction because you're not going to yeah. see it otherwise. In the, the evening or date or nighttime, you probably will, but it's going to be really tough to pick. And that was kind of a disappointment. It's like, man, you know, if that really was kerosene out there, I'm pretty <laughs> sure we'd be able to see it. Even you know four or five hundred miles away. Once it gets up high enough, yeah. All right, so guys, uh, I think uh, SpaceX has just put this out up on its website, um, and I think uh, let me just yeah. And you see, the contrail was down there, and you're at the point that you don't get it anymore. So when the hot staging yeah. happened, they were high. See, where were they at the hot staging? They were okay, 70, uh, 75 kilometers. So the air is pretty thin at that point. You're not going to get yeah. many much atmospheric uh, condensation. And then the altitude continues to go up for the booster. So even though it looks like the booster's falling down, the boss, the booster's not actually falling down. It's still going up. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's this weird optical illusion. Yeah. I'm just trying to share screen and show and I, you. And I got my prop presets. back here that if, if we want to go ahead and use this. So I, I ordered this nice. uh, a little, little while ago. It's, yeah. It's, it's pretty cool because it's actually made out of chrome. <laughs> it's not, not plastic. <laughs> And they use these rare earth magnets in here. It's like oh, really okay. hard to oh, pull the cool. thing off. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, this yeah. is not the one that has like the uh, 
the flamethrower on it. Yeah. But uh, we can see the six uh, engines uh, that are on there. And so we get the three yeah. RVACs on the outside and then the three in the inside, which gimbal. And these are the sea level ones. And I guess, I mean, the main reason they have the sea level ones is that when they do land, you want to use the sea level ones for landing because that's the only time you're really using it at sea level. Um, and the RVACs, you can't, and I don't think you can gimbal them. So you would, you'd want those for control. The interesting thing is that we're going to notice later on is that as when they start to, to, to press towards orbit, they shut down the RVAX and they were only using the internal ones. I guess maybe for gimbling. It was like, well, wait a minute. They're in the vacuum of space. Why are they using the sea level? Shouldn't they be using the RVAX now at that point? So that was a rather interesting observation. I didn't even notice that. They, yeah, it it no. might have been it might have been to uh, uh, reduce performance. Because, yeah. Uh, they, yeah. They weren't carrying payload because normally yeah. what we would expect to see is keep the RVAX going and then uh, take this down the, the sea really level down to, the, to one engine. Oh, man. See, that's the thing. It was like really hard to get off is, is the magnet they have in there. Now, uh -huh. of course, after I get this thing, it's like, well, wait a minute. This is the original one. This, this is the IFT one. They don't have yeah. the hot staging hot ring. ring. So you can now actually buy the hot staging ring on the SpaceX <laughs> website for like 125 bucks. Everybody's like, that's quite the upgrade. Just get this little thing I can put in here just to make it more accurate now. So, Man, they 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 know a sucker when they have one. So, <laughs> so there we go. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's uh, cool. It's cool. Yeah. All right. So let me just pull up the website. Um, and there you go. Uh, SpaceX has a lot to say about uh, today's um, flight test. All right. So all three Raptor engines um, started up successfully, completed a full duration burn during ascent. Mm -hmm. uh, Starship. Ex executed second successful hot stage separation. That's what we we're just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, six second stage Raptor engines uh, successfully ignited. Super uh, the super heavy booster successfully completed its flip maneuver uh, following separation, completing okay, a full, full boost back burn. burn. Yes. So there you go, a full, full boost duration. back burn. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So we still don't know what's happened. Um, as far as the splashdown is concerned, right? Where it went, yeah. uh, what shape it was in. That'll yeah. be interesting to see how much of control they had on it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so, yeah, so... So from what I could see when it came down again, there was no re-entry burn. And we saw that it was dropping and I was wondering when it was going to light. And it looks like right around one kilometer altitude, they attempted to light. So they just went straight to the landing burn. And only one center engine opened, and then not the the inner rings. Um, you ended up getting um, two, looks like two of them the opened up. They lit, and that was it. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I thought all the center ones wanted to, to light up there. Yeah, and so it was supposed to be all thirteen. Okay, so and something then down to three. It. Yeah, then down to three. Um, yeah, and and you could see some something coming out the end. But you didn't see everything light up. And I assume that they're supposed to light yeah. up for a long time, not like a short period. Because it's possible there could be a glitch in the telemetry that yeah. if it missed so, that window for a second or two, it's something else. But if it's like yeah. a five or ten second burn. <laughs> I would I, expect I maybe like a two or three second burn for the, oh, it's, for the, it's for possible the 13. Then, but, yeah. and, then, and then a longer burn for the three. A longer burn for the three. Okay. Uh, so enough to – because it was coming down at about a kilometer up. It was going, I think, about 1,300 kilometers uh, per hour. Yeah. In, in the fall okay so yeah, we can see you, when it's going up it's, engines, it's well above uh, the, 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 the uh, one common line full throttle then you then you should be getting deceleration on, on, on the order of 10g <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's a lot yeah that's, um, all right so so what spacex says is the booster's flight concluded approximately 462 meters um and just in altitude <laughs> just under seven minutes so that's really um Oh, okay. Was the it rod? Was, rod was, was at FTS triggered, or was, oh, it was a rod? Okay. There's, oh, it was so it, 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 yeah. it didn't. It didn't slam. Yeah. Okay, I thought it was going to slam it into the water. Up. No. So yeah, okay, so there, there's something was going on with the Raptors. Okay. So yeah, maybe a cascading failure. Yeah, that's probably what it was then. Okay. Yeah, I thought it, it also, hit the water. I mean, that that reentry, it, it looked like it wasn't quite. I mean, it was it was a little bit all over the place. Yeah, mm. it wasn't. Now, what would what they, would be what would be the result of it being all over the place on a reentry? Um, the grid fin should be able to control a lot of that. So, do you think there was yeah. a leak? So it, it could have been a leak. 
uh, it could have been that there wasn't enough control authority. Maybe there was uh, too much prop sloshing around, throwing off the center of mass. I mean, but but you know, if it, if it's if it's bottom heavy, which it would be, on, be. on reentry, then it should be relatively stable. But it might still, but it might it might be that there's not enough control authority, and it's just kind of flopping around a little bit. Uh, like even though it's stable, it might it might have been oscillating and the grid fence. Right, and then the other thing to remember is, is that you have, two, you have two tanks. Stable. You get two yeah. tanks. You get this tank in the bottom, and you get a tank that's up a bit yeah. higher. And if you get some sloshing going around up there, right. that could be the that one could, that you know really causes yeah. that moment arm. Um, but but I mean that is the lighter one, and I think for yeah. for the landing, what you actually have is that you're basically using the fuel in the downcomer, and then mm -hmm. you have the sump for the oxygen. So there's there okay. shouldn't be much. There's not much left there. Okay. And whatever it is, it's it's, it's not very dense. Um, but I mean, it could have been it, it, not enough control authority. It could have been. Some people are saying that it looked like a software problem where it was just uh, the the control algorithm wasn't damped enough. It was overcorrecting. Um, yeah, because maybe they haven't done enough testing to yeah. know exactly what the aerodynamic parameters are. So maybe yeah, they're going to go through and find out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard somebody say, "Oh, maybe maybe they lost the fin, and the other three were trying to correct for it." Okay, that's so there's, that's there's possible. Just... <laughs> Yeah, we're not seeing a all the fins. fins. Right, we're seeing right, one right. of them moving around there without any yeah. any particular problem. Uh, the only other, see, it made it through the hot staging okay, and everything lit up. So, yeah, yeah. maybe you can rule out any damage from well, the hot staging. The other possibility is that the pressure dome was doing fine, was maybe slightly damaged, but was not damaged enough to cause a problem for the boost back. But then by the time you maybe. get down there, maybe something else. So I'm I'm wondering that. They can't yeah. rule out the hot staging having caused something mm. that may be right. hey, hey, escalated did, did, later on. Didn't it change the shape uh, of the pressure dome for this test as opposed to the last one? Um, yes, they did. It, oh, it's they more did. rounded. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ring Watchers had has a uh, has a really good summary of all the major change, changes that were visible from the outside, or yeah, that that that, that they okay. could see from the construction. And one okay, of so we're seeing right there. That's, common that's right at the moment it rutted, and you you could see that it was definitely vibrating very heavily there. And the other thing is, when you look at the graphic, you, you'll notice it's not vertical. You'd think it should be vertical at that point. Um, I wouldn't really expect it to be. There's supposed to be some lift. That's what the chines are there for. Okay. And you've also got the horizontal uh, velocity component that you probably haven't, you know, zeroed Completely out. Completely zeroed out, yeah. Uh, but the the you know the propellant loads look right. I was trying to study them to make sure because I, I know in the past the locks and the, the CH four sometimes. Um, get out of whack yeah and you could say whoops we got a leak here but it seemed right. like everything was progressing down correctly so we could roll that now right there in this shot just pause it for a second there does seem to be at least one tile missing there does that look like a tile that's missing or is that something else that's missing? oh that white white uh yeah I think that's that looks like yeah. Poop. <laughs> yeah so we know at least one came off the other thing we know yeah. is that just before re-entry when they started flapping the wings there was all kinds of dark crap that just started yeah. you know floating <laughs> around before we were seeing a lot of of, of white ice and that yeah. was like oh what's that are the, hopefully those and tiles there was there was off. a clear what, audible what, reaction what, what, as well. yes now yeah. my speculation could be is like let's remember that it was a very windy day you had 30 mile per hour gusts going around there you're down in the beach it's very sandy and you've got the frosty building up right yeah. so you're having a lot of ice everywhere and it's possible <clears throat> You could have a lot of dirt and grit that was getting uh, entrained in that ice as it was forming. So you ended up having basically brown ice. That's one possibility of yeah. what was coming off of there. Speculation on my part. Ozan, what do you think? Is that the one So way I was it? actually not clear if mm -hmm. it may have even been normal clear ice or, you know, long size methane ice, uh, ice that, could have, that, that could have, you know, condensed on the, on the vehicle um, post venting. Uh, because I wasn't, I didn't have, you know, like I said, I was watching this on a tiny phone camera. I mean, it's a phone screen. Um, and uh, I didn't have a chance to really examine where the sun was in relationship to the vehicle. So if, it, if the, yeah, like depending possible. on the angle of the sun, it could have, it could have been that, you know, ice shadow. looked dark. Yeah. Because right. Because right. The shadow. reason why it's, a, it's like blocking the, the uh, reflection off the surface of the, the earth. The reason why clouds look dark, the clouds yeah. aren't actually black. It's just that it's not being illuminated from that side. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're the chunks that are kind of coming off. We see are, are, are definitely bright colored. They're white. 
Mm -hmm. And then later on, and it's going to be way down. I don't know how far you can get into the stream, Ozan, or, or uh, right in right. when we get to um, what's it's probably going to be around the 40, 40 minute or beyond that. Yeah. In the stream, or probably 43. even well. Yeah. So at least T, T plus 45 or 43, somewhere around there is when we start to get the reentry. Every time I see that, yeah. I, I get these um, interstellar vibes. Don't you? <laughs> I mean, just looking at that, that just feels like the scene yeah. right out of Interstellar. It does. I mean, it's also shuttle vibes, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. 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 But still, just something about the placement of the camera is the same uh -huh. camera that uh, placement that Chris Nolan had. And then the buffeting right. and everything else are kind of going on there. And because that was the, the strangest angle that he had from the standpoint of cinematography. It's like, why was he shooting it from there? Because normally, you can shoot it from anywhere. You could have this outer, outer, but he just decided that he wanted the perspective from somewhere on that. And when mm. you see this now, it's just like, wow, he really was thinking in the future of, of what the telemetry is going to look like. Uh, so every, yeah, every time I go back to that movie, when I see this, okay, so that's plus yeah, nine right. minutes. We One need thing to get, that, that yeah. surprised me was the, you know, constant venting. I mean, I guess it wasn't too much of a surprise. I was wondering if that's what we would see if, they yeah. would be venting continually to keep the propellant settled. I don't know if that was the motivation or if they were just trying to keep the pressure at, at, the, at a particular uh, level. They needed to do a propellant transfer, right? And they did. It's still a and bit then, of a and, mystery. And where they where were they transferring it from and to? I think what I heard was it's, it's from the header ox tank to the main ox right. tank. Yeah. Okay. And could that be a reason for them to having to do some venting while that process was going on? Because uh, it's not sure, clear yeah. when they did that. They just said, oh, successful. Yeah, I think that they had a timeline for it, uh, you know, before. They the, didn't tell the us. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was on the, it was on the website. It was like a you okay. know, T, T plus whatever minutes. I, I, didn't, I haven't had a chance to go back and look at that. Uh, they also had that for the engine relight. And the, mm -hmm. um, it was in the, it was in the, the uh, mission timeline. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they, they may have vented for that. So is that look I mean, like they, they would have to had you to or does that, that look like a leak? It looks like venting for uh, venting to me. Okay. Now would that be causing their, their problems with attitude control? Um, it could, it, it's possible that. So, okay. So we know that on the last flight, they were carrying more propellant than they could use. And they inventing that propellant was what uh, fueled the fire that caused the rud for the ship. And they decided not to do it this that way for this flight. I don't know that they underloaded the propellant. I think that they still had a, a full propellant load, right? So you, you would expect there, there to be about 100 tons-ish of propellant still on board uh, at the time of orbital insertion. You would... If you don't get rid of that, and if you let that slosh around in the tanks, that's going to collapse um, the hot gas that you have in there. And then, yeah, if you don't, if it doesn't have a chance to warm up, then you're not going to have enough enough gas, enough warm gas to do um, their uh, RCS, you know, reaction control. Right. Uh, and and they, yes, they did need more. So their uh, reaction control ability is for the just... propellant transfer and and then the the relight. So they're not using cold gas thrusters for the reaction control. It's all from the autonomous uh, they, system. They, they are, but it's basically it's basically venting, venting the main tanks is their cold gas. Okay, okay. So you still need to pressure. Okay, so yeah. Again. So you you want you know, ideally about six bar of hot gas in your. your and your you can't warm, create warm it right gas. now because the because the engines aren't running anymore. It's cooling exactly down. yeah. So and it's so... it's whatever you're left with. Right, and it's eventually so you have to cool down to about 300 uh, Kelvin. Uh, yep. If you have no liquid, if you do have liquid, it's going to condense and and cool, and whatever gas you have left is going to cool down to closer to 100. Uh, but right. as you get boil off, it's you know you're going to get that um, pressurization again. But I think the first thing that's going to happen is you know condensation from just all of that cold. Um, liquid and if you're if they're venting i mean yeah maybe they were so so that might have been slowly venting the uh the liquids so if you keep them settled then you can just like gradually leak it out um so that you you can keep the liquid and the gas separated until you you've drained most of the liquid from the tanks and then and then you have 
uh, hopefully mostly still warm gas at ideally uh, close to six bar in the tanks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to use for uh, the okay. Now, the, the, now that you just the, change the relay. quickly there, so how much can we trust the orientation of the Starship at that point? So it looks like its nose is pointing to forward, and then at some point it's turned around. Yeah, when does that happen? Um, I think after 10 minutes or something like that. So the engines are now kind of pointed in the direction of, of orbit. And yeah. so I'm wondering whether that thrusting, you know, how much is that venting affecting the Delta V? Right. An excellent question. <laughs> yeah. Because the one thing that they that was said on the live stream was that um, because of the margins they had in hitting the landing zone, they weren't going to do the relight. It said something about the, the relight was not going to be a retrograde burn, which I assume is what it was. I, I thought the reason why they weren't going at the coast of Hawaii is that Raptor burn was going to bring it down early. But it sounded yeah. like that, oh, no, it was, it was actually it one that might rain. increase the Delta V. Yeah. And if it does that, then you're going to overshoot. They didn't want to overshoot it. And it's like, why are they overshooting? Because they overperformed? Or because something is pushing it <laughs> in the direction? Yeah, yeah, maybe... Maybe they got more uh, from the vent than they were expecting. Yeah. But it also seemed like they lost attitude control. Yeah, so it could be that they decided that they couldn't do it. But it, the excuse that was being given didn't seem to match, let's say, some of the other things you were kind of wondering. And it may just come right. down to they decided it was too dangerous to light it because they could rud. And they would rather get the reentry data as opposed yeah. to knowing yeah. whether they could light this in space or not. Mm -hmm. that, that, they prob that was probably the top. Because I think... That was something that was newly added. Yeah. The, the yeah. Starting up the Raptor in space, so that was like fourth on the on the to do list, and they decided, nope, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're going to take it off right now. Yeah, yeah, because by then now, they'd already um, kind of successfully conducted the the payload door maneuver, the propellant transfer. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think most most of the key targets had been met. Um, yes. So it was it was a kind of a, a risk that they were willing to take. Whether it worked right. out or not, it was a kind of a plus, an added bonus. If, if that's yeah. And remember, the payload is data. It's still yeah. That's 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 the main yeah. thing. And right now, yeah. what was the most important data? And it's like we need to see how these heat tiles perform. We we need to know what the controlled reentry is going to look like. Uh, yeah. So Ozan, in your opinion, when we lost telemetry, do you think that's when it rutted? Because they seem to think like, oh, we were expecting <laughs> to go into into blackout now. Yeah. So they they said that they lost TDRS telemetry at the same time as they lost Starlink. Uh, which seemed to suggest that the vehicle blew, blew up. Let me, yeah. Put, so let me, yeah, there you go. So what they're saying is um, last telemetry signals received via Starlink at approximately 49 minutes into the mission. And that's it. There's no more details after that. Yeah. We don't know uh, when RUD <laughs> took place or under yes. what circumstances. They, they have RUD and they have RID. Rapid iterative development. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I think so, that, that I mean, is, I there's there's just so much to take away from this. I, I just so guys, I just want to talk about this. Um, so so the propellant transfer had a certain cost associated with it, right? Because they had mm -hmm. to prove it, uh, and yeah. NASA has been very watching watching development of uh, of Starship very very closely. There's been so much of controversy over you know the timelines and and what happens to Artemis and all of that. And I think this was one of the the milestones that they needed to they needed to hit, perhaps overdue. Uh, but they've kind of got it locked down now, so that's that's good, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I I think that it was it was great that they did it on the first. This was the first chance that they they had to do it, right? I I mean, the the first time that they had uh, that prolonged uh, zero g experience with. Methylox. I mean, they could have tried to set it up on Falcon to to do it, but like, you know, this is supposed to happen on Starship, and this is the first time that Starship experienced prolonged zero G. So, I think that it, you know, I was from from the way that Elon has talked about it in the past, I was thinking that oh, they're they're really they've really deprioritized that, and they're going to put that off until the last minute. But it's it seemed like they were ready to try it out. Um, kind of first chance they got i mean obviously yeah. if ift2 had gone according to plan they they would have had an opportunity then too but you know right really they weren't ready 
but I think guys, they've done a lot of catching up to their credit <coughs> um, with this yeah. launch. And perhaps, I, so going into it, my concern was, are they have they got just too many set up, too many, too many milestones to hit along the way? Have they just kind of maybe bitten off more than was optimal for for one launch? Um, perhaps in hindsight, it may be the case, but. They've got um, some... I, I don't think any of those would have caused any problems, and, and I think they prioritize yeah. them right. The only yeah. thing you might bring into question is, oh, did you want to bring the, the PEZ dispenser or or check that thing out because that you know, some structural integrity issues that you might have on there, just making sure you can do it, and which was yeah. more important, the uh, propellant transfer. But I think they decided that they could do both of them with very minimal risk. The Raptor yeah. was obviously something they could decide to do or not do. Um and more than likely, I think what they did is they probably did the propellant transfer before they attempted to open that, because that was probably the number one question mark they had. Yeah, and that just don't compromise just look at the size of that thing. Yeah. That's that's massive inside. Yes, yes. Now mm -hmm. there's a, I think there is some speculation on the next launch whether they're going to actually attempt to deploy um, some yeah. Starlink satellites. Starlinks? Yeah. And that would be cool. They have enough confidence. Now, in order to do that, yeah. they have to get themselves into the right orbit. I'm not sure whether it has to be like an instantaneous launch window or whether they can pretty much launch anytime they want. They um, should be able to launch anytime they want if they're willing to. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, which they, they should be able to, to launch anytime they want because yeah. uh, for uh, uh, land alignment, you know, you can just take your time in the yep. uh, getting up to. Yeah. operational yeah. altitude. So, so so it's not like ISS where you have to hit it at a particular time. Yeah. Usually what they do with the Starlink launches around here is that if they miss the window, it's like they wait 45 minutes. So they're kind of yeah. looking at the weather. They have that three three hour window, but the window is like certain times that they want to hit to be able to get it just exactly where they want. So if they're not too picky about exactly which orbit it goes into, they may do it. And then, But then they have to be confident enough that um, are they going to go into, an, again, do one of these things where the orbit automatically brings the starship down or whether they're going to have to go to a higher orbit because that's where you want to actually deploy these things and then need to confidently bring the starship back down it's yeah, still you, a gamble you can't, you can't really uh, deploy starlinks with it's much below like 250 kilometer uh perigee yeah. so, so it's that's, gonna, that's it's something that up. it would yeah uh, so that's that's you know that was the like it would have been really nice if they had gotten that relight because then they would have felt confident to go directly into a, a deployment orbit on the next flight and then been able to deploy Starlinks exactly. and be like, oh, they, they, they're going to have to repeat that. But the more I think about it, uh, the more I realize if they actually feel confident about their fix, uh, they don't have to be you know 100% sure that it's going to work or have demonstrated it. But if, if they've identified some issues and they think they have, you know let's say, 80, 90% chance of being able to relight, then what they could do is do this kind of a uh, an initial insertion with a uh, with a low perigee, and then do a second burn at uh, at apogee, which was about you know two hundred. I think it was supposed to be two hundred thirty five kilometers for this flight. They could go up to like two two fifty two eighty whatever the Starlink uh, uh, deployment perigee right, at the low point, and then do you know attempt a relight, and if it works, then you know, they go up to a 350 kilometer apogee and, and at that point they have some, like if, if that burn works, they have some confidence that they're going to, they're going to be able to deploy and relight again to deorbit down. Starship. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a reasonable thing to do. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to ask you that. And they want to make sure they, that they, on that relight, that they don't rud 250 miles up because then they're yes. creating quite mm. a cloud of junk that's going to take a while yeah. to count. Yeah. So they, they're going to... I mean, if they if count. they run at the start of the burn, it should still be fine. They don't want to run at the end of the burn. Yeah. Oh, the you end. mean the, oh, the, the third but relight. The, the, yeah, the third relight. Third you know, if at yeah. that point... So they, yes. they have to know that every time they do it, uh, it's not... The relights don't become riskier and riskier and, and sure. more sketchy and what's going to happen. So... Yeah. Um, that might be the All only right. concern. The, the I'm other going to ask is... a dumb question here, but for mm -hmm. the benefit of, our, of of those watching who may not be as technically clued in, just take us through the challenges of, of the relight in space. Uh, well, okay. The, the first thing is like whenever you have a campfire, you've got um, you've got wood, right, which is fuel, and you've got the air around you. The thing is you need a lighter to get it started. So the first thing is just because you have fuel and oxidizer, you need something to be able to get this started up. 
Um, I know that in Falcon 9, they actually use these chemicals that they mix in there that spontaneously kind of cause it to burst into flames. But I think uh, they're using some sort of igniter. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I lost track of where they ended up with that. I think it might be spark ignition and the pre burners, yep. and then and then so basically the pre burners uh, maybe come out with a high enough temperature that when you mix that, that puts so, them, so the that they, yeah, that's the first up. thing is 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 you got to make sure you have an ignition source <clears throat> that's reliable and is going to work. The other, of course, you got to pump that stuff in there in the first place and so you got to make sure that your tanks are settled and everything because that's a problem is that you're drawing down from these tanks and if the tanks um have a, a lot of empty space or they've been sloshing around you may not be ingesting in fuel but you know or, or yeah. repellent you may just be ingesting nothing um or, and or so gas. that's right which, just gas not which not, is, not nearly dense enough to which start those it's going to kind of cause a rud and the other thing is that how do they spin up these turbines are they using? I think it's it's. Uh, I think they have COPVs for it. So I, okay. I think they have high pressure high pressure gas. High pressure gases. So is, is it like helium? If I'm not mistaken. There? Okay, so they used to like I'm that. Not, to I'm not it sure. Up. Yeah. Um, where they ended up with it, I know that they eventually want to eliminate all the helium, but I think that they might still have a few COPVs. Yeah, because I, I, I think prime the prime the pre burners or prime now, the uh, turbines. Um, Rocket Lab, they they use electric motors for that. Yeah. So, um, so that may be a possibility in the future. Uh, there was, I haven't had a chance to look at this one interview. Uh, I don't remember who did it with well, a startup that's working on, on basically uh, electric jet engines Yeah. and how that could potentially be used. Because when, when you have the, um, the, the pumps that you have, have two sides that are basically mirrors of one another, you've got a turbine on one side and a compressor on the other. And the compressor is what basically is pumping everything through. But in order to get the compressor to work, you need to have something to spin it. You need a motor to get it to go. Well, that's the turbine side. And the clever thing is you kind of combine the two that the stuff you're trying to pump is the, actually like the fuel you can use to run this darn thing. So it's, it's kind of a vicious circle. It's going there. The problem is you got to get that thing started up somehow. Mm -hmm. So you got to spin up that turbine. And, and you know the best way to do it is just like you, you take a pinwheel, you just go blow on it and start to spin. So you do that to get it up to finally get the stuff to go through and then it starts sucking stuff in and you can start burning everything and everything else. The idea is like eliminate the turbine because the turbine is an expensive, complex piece of equipment and just keep the compressor part and replace that with an electric motor. And if that electric motor gets you enough performance and the batteries and everything, if that if the weight penalty for that is way less, then that might be a wise way to go in the future that use something like that to be able to make it easier to spin up. So you've got to spin those things up. You've got to get the fuel going there. You've got to make the fuel is make sure the fuel is settled, which in orbit is just not an easy thing. Yeah. It's it, it becomes a challenge, which is why they almost always use these ullage motors, which they don't want to have. So what the ullage motor is, it's they're these tiny little motors that are very easy to start up because in many cases they might just be like a solid rocket motor that you light up that actually pushes the vehicle forward for a couple of seconds. And in just that little burn, it creates enough gravity, artificial gravity, to settle everything. And now you can go ahead and start lighting everything up. But that's something they don't want to have in Starship. And, th and what it means is that every time you do a startup, you have to solve the ullage problem. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how they plan on doing that. Do you, do you know? Is it just going to be cold gas thrusters again and again? I think and again? for now, it, yeah. it's, yeah, cold gas thrusters, which might mean, if they're, if they're just going off of the main tanks, it might mean that they have to keep um that that they have to keep the uh keep those main tanks venting so that the liquid in there is settled or they have to deplete mm -hmm. the liquid and then just ah, right there like stop, stop stop right now pause that okay, okay. these are the chunks those Space are the chunks, chunks. okay yeah that doesn't look like ice <laughs> does, does it i mean actually no it is it is a shadow really it could be ice uh it's just weird shapes but that doesn't mean it's, it's not ice um and then you'll see it kind of floating off over there, and it seems to stay dark the whole time. I mean, it 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 looks it looks creepy. So as you continue on, and yeah, know, so so the light is go coming from the other side. Um, like it's between you and the light, right? So I it's yep. I don't know if we, we if we get a good view with it uh, lit from above. Okay, so it's lit from above right now. And then where do the chunks okay. start? From? White chunks. White chunks, white yeah, chunks. They're, chunks. they're really small white chunks, and then they get really big. And it seems to happen when they start doing the flaps. Yes. 
So once yeah, the there might have been there might have been some ice. There was a notable in there. Yeah. Uh, there was a notable reaction also. Okay, now it's going into darkness. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so everything is in shade. So everything we're seeing from this side is shaded. There you go. The chunks are going. Okay, it starts out white. And then we starts get out white. into. And now they start oh. getting darker and darker. Yeah. It's timed with the. Uh... Yeah, those are some big. Yeah, time with the shadow. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's, litter. It's, it's a play of it's light. Just, it absolutely looks like, and it, it keep it going because it, it becomes a lot. <laughs> I mean, it looks like they were littering in space. Yeah, I think this might just be ice. Yeah, so it was a little bit white for a second there, and then it goes very dark. Okay. So some are yeah, kind of almost brownish looking off. chunks. Yeah. Oh, that's a big piece. I mean, look at that. <laughs> yeah. And that's why you look at it and you're thinking, is that insulation coming from underneath the, um, the oh, heat tiles? Oh, was that a tile? It, None yeah, of them were tiles, tiles, right? right so it, it it would have to be they would all have to be tiles that were torn somehow. Yep. Which seems pretty unlikely. Yeah. They'll all be tearing off, but it seemed to be tiles. Yeah, we also don't see flaps. very many missing tiles on uh, on it afterwards. Right. Unless they're out of view. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I, I think ice is still the most most likely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna play the spike again. Oh yeah. It becomes a swarm at one point. Yeah. So the size of these things keep just increasing. <laughs> yeah, they start getting bigger and bigger chunks. There you go. It could Look be that. that they're uh, they're leaving closer to the camera. That could be a factor. Yep, that too. Yeah, exactly. They they fly right by, so it's a perspective. Yep. Hmm. So they're always big. It's just that you happen to get them a lot closer to the point of view. I mean, that's, but that's just yeah. like the weirdest <laughs> shape for ice. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it seems like it was a sheet. Yeah. That broke up. It lo looks to me like, you know, uh, um, uh, corrugated flakes. cardboard, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's been torn up, thrown out there. But again, that's, yeah, uh, they're also, they, they, they also we see whatever we want to it. be, uh, to be tiles. Yeah. Yeah. Too thin, unless it was like some substrate underneath the tiles, but I, I don't right. think so. Yeah, and it's about 108 kilometers. So it's, I think the last was about what, 65 kilometers mm -hmm. above when uh, the feed cut out. So right. And is, now what's amazing yeah. is that let's wait until it get, the altitude gets down to 100 kilometers. And what happens at exactly 100 kilometers? <laughs> it's, I, I just could not believe that right at that number what happens 103 you're almost there now what's interesting is the speed actually starts picking up yeah even though it's coming down and that so this camera is on the falling. flap right yeah it's on the yes. flap yes so it's a, basically a GoPro on the flap yeah now right at 100 101 what's happening right now we're starting to see <laughs> some heating right at 100. Yeah, Look at that. There you okay. go. That now, what's the significance of 100? <laughs> what's the significance of 100 kilometers altitude, Ozan? It's the Carmen line. It's the Carmen line. Yes. I mean, now you know why the Carmen line is right where it is. It's like, it really is arbitrary. They still argue over like, <laughs> why is it there? And, you know, Theodore von Carmen, he just decided, you know, based on something, he's like, it, we're going to call it 100 kilometers. Yeah. And, so plasma. And, and now right there, there you have enough line. air at that point enough yeah. atmospheric drag that you can start to create a plasma and evidently yeah. at, at like 101 no <laughs> it's amazing which it's that was a, really surprising it, it, it might also have a little bit to do with the i don't know i don't know the yeah the attitude you know at that point yeah they, yeah it might be, so, it might be the in attitude, other words someone but... plugged in oh the one comer lights at 100 <laughs> this is where we're gonna do it and they came up with the, okay, it okay so it's it's a bit circular going on here so. yeah and then also, you know, you have you have a little bit of time uh, for the for the ship to heat up on the way way in. Yeah. That, that probably right. is also a little bit of a factor. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, it's, it is it is part. a like for for those who are you know listening, it is a it is a gradual transition about every five to ten yeah. kilometers, depending on your altitude. You, you, it's, that's the it's, it's not like a swimming pool where, where, where yeah, yeah, it's it's not like there's a dividing line between the water and the atmosphere. There's not a dividing yeah. line between the atmosphere and space. It's a very gradual yeah. thing. So at a hundred okay, so this if we can pause you get here. air. Yeah, so uh, um this is something where you know watching this, I was like, 
you know, the commentators didn't say anything. You could kind of hear the groans or, or the, the oohs and ahs in the, in, at the headquarters. But what I saw throughout that reentry prof profile was the direction of the, um, of the flame kind of shifting several times. Right, like the the vehicle keeps changing orientation in a way that doesn't seem under control. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I, I I I thought so too. But I I was kind of wondering whether it was the effect of the camera being on the flap. I don't think so because I mean, if you can, if you look, look relative to the relative to the uh, to the rest of the ship, like where the flame. Where the flame is going, where it's coming from, where it's like where where the you know you you can follow that line to see what's you know what angle is the is the ship hitting the atmosphere with and it's shifting, mm -hmm. right? The rear and flap is not changing attitude. orientation, but but the yeah yeah why is it pointed down? Why is, why is it pointed down? Constant, you know, and yeah. again, is that an error on the dis the display or is that actually what's going on? Yeah, so you might. Uh, so one thing that you might want to do, so you're coming in um, at a little bit of an angle, well, no, at, at a substantial angle of attack and you get some lift, right? That's how it's supposed to come in. And it might be that to keep it, so this was a particularly relatively steep re-entry to make sure uh, that they got enough thermal load. So this would be steeper than what you would typically see from uh, uh, Leo. So I don't think that they are in danger of you know skipping off the atmosphere, but uh, you might want to uh, point that lift vector down to increase that um, that thermal load. So you might want to kind of rotate the vehicle in the in its um, basically mm. put some yaw on the on the vehicle to rotate in that plane. So it still has that same angle of attack, but now the lift is pointing down instead of instead of up uh, or, or sideways. So, so you're, you're kind of maneuvering. That is basically what the shuttle did, right? It, it zigzagged. It didn't really do the down thing, but it, it did do left and right. Um, but it looked like there was more going on. Like it's, it seemed like it was getting hit from the side. You know, it seemed like flames were coming out. It, Coming out the side of the of the vehicle, and not just you know uh, symmetrically towards the back. Um, so it, it seemed like it, it may have been. I mean, it's certain there was certainly a little bit of a tumble going in, right? And it's not clear to me that it ever straightened out properly and got under control. Yeah, like here. Okay, we've got. If you look at that that flame front, it seems like it's. Um, you got a lot more heating on one side of the vehicle than the other, which isn't really what you would expect. You would expect it to be symmetric around the base, or around the bottom. Yeah, around the heat around tiles. The pile part, yeah. Because now what you're doing is you're cooking the part which is stainless steel. Yeah. And you don't want that, exactly. All right, so yeah, then it rotates right, yeah. again, and it's it's getting back to the orientation that we might expect. Mm-hmm. And this 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 little this little movement there, yeah, that, that was probably a that, flat movement. Okay, that was a flat movement, but it also changed pretty rapidly yeah. down in the display. Yes. It was almost timed together. <clears throat> of course, yeah, the flat but, movement is going to change, uh, yeah. cause a change in orientation. And that's pretty much near. And I think the other part of the demonstration we forgot about is the connection to Starlink. Mm. This is the the most solid demonstration they've done in orbit. Yeah. I don't know if they even had any any before the last time they wanted to, but they couldn't quite they didn't quite get up there. Okay, I'll so it that. seems that the bottom flaps on the top are, are kind of not moving together. Is that does that uh, tell you that there's a uh, maybe a, a a more of a vertical movement? Yeah. So um, if you if you move them separately, then uh, you can control pitch. Hmm. Right. So if you pull the the front flaps up and push the uh, bottom flaps down. Then what you're going to get is more more lift in the back, and that's going to mm -hmm. be nose down, and you know vice versa. Um, you're also going to, yeah, depending on your angle of attack. This uh, is pitching. That's the pitching. Yeah. We're talking about right there. Yeah, and then depending on you on your angle of, of of attack, the the stable configuration for your flaps changes. So if you've if you've adjusted your angle of attack so that you're you're coming in either with like a 
uh, more of a flap to the to the wind or or more of a nose to the wind orientation, right. you might need to ch adjust your flap angle to keep that stable. Yeah. Right. Now, okay, so um, I'm looking in the direction of movement. It appears they were coming in tail first, right? Is that um, how they were orienting? So it, it's initially or, or here. It. It's hard to tell. So which do you think they're <laughs> yeah. they're, they're coming yeah. in like this? So this is this is our angle of attack. Hmm. Or yeah, because because of that rotation, it's really hard to tell which way the, the which way it's moving. <laughs> the movement is yeah. I'm not 100 percent sure which way. See, right now, it seems like it's, it's it was moving that way, <laughs> yeah. kind of going through orbit like this. Um, just wondering if it's like this, and then you know. It seems to be way. coming in bottom first. Yeah, so I think it's yeah, it's, it's on the, in the case, okay. Yeah. So right now it's bottom first, which means if it is coming in bottom first, you have a negative lift vector at this point. Your angle of attack is not positive. You you want to be if you're coming in bottom first. If you were moving this direction, you want to be like that to get some sort of angle of attack. Yeah, so and and you don't actually. I, I'm pretty sure that it's not designed to be uh, going in bottom first. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, I, I thought it was supposed to be going in like this. Yeah, I mean, right? why would yeah, you want to go no, yeah, You're just going to be overheating to, these things. Yeah. To, uh, yes. Hotels, yeah. So, so something is strange there. So they, yeah. they, it, they, maybe the graphic is throwing us off and they're trying to correlate the graphic with the movement you're seeing out there and it's a bit confusing. But uh, if, so you, if, you, know, if you look at like the this. claims, they all look like they're... Just fry, the, fry the raptors, wouldn't yeah, they? Yeah, the whole purpose of... Well, you could have some... I guess you could have some of the flames coming around here. So you would get that flow. So I would expect... You could see some of the plasma that way, but so I, yes. I hope it's going in like this. And again, as that ozone talks, but you about, wouldn't you wouldn't expect it to to come back towards you, which I think in some of the shots we see we see the plasma. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Up. So if it, if it's like coming in this way, yeah, then we would expect it to come towards the camera. Yeah, so if it's coming which, around that which way, I think there are there are some shots where where it's and that's it weird. So so like it's almost like it's tumbling like this, because you were saying something about yawing. Yeah, so this is your yaw direction. Right. So your yaw is basically going to cause it to keep changing, which is the pointy end forward. You know, so it's going to be going around like that. So th these flaps will allow you to adjust it if if they're done in concert. Yeah. That these these two are symmetric in their movement, and these right. are symmetric in the movement. You're going to get that pitching. But if mm -hmm. this and this is out of phase, uh, see one way you can get a roll out of yeah. it. And you you yeah. do something. You do else, diagonals. You, get, you get get this. Yeah, you do a diagonal, yeah. and then you'll get some kind of roll and everything else. Yeah. So that's how they're able to control it. And I'm not sure, do they have as, in some directions, they've got more control authority than others. So yeah. I think they have some control authority in yaw, but not a whole lot. But you've got a whole lot in pitch that you're able yeah. to control. So now if you did want to, you know, have your lift vector pointed down, you know, if you're, if you're coming in like mm. this, you wouldn't just want to rotate like like this. I mean, I think I think this, I, I, I said this before, but uh, giving us some more thought. Uh, you, you would want to rotate like this, right? So mm. it'd be a little bit of a roll in yaw, mm. uh, so that you would oh. still be, uh, you know, nose to the wind, <laughs> and yes. nose and belly to the wind, right? Yes, exactly. You may be doing something weird down, like that. Down, but yeah. there, there's really the only reason why would you ever want to have a downward lift vector? Because what that's doing is that's pushing you down making faster. You, yeah, which is making you go faster. It's making you going to overheat. The only reason yes. you want to... you'd want to do that if you're if you're trying to make sure that you don't go too far down range. And yeah. if you're trying to max out the load on your TPS to test it. Yes, test yeah, it. exactly. Otherwise, you normally wouldn't do it. And the only other thing is that you're risking. See, if you do this too hard, would you skip? Could that cause you to skip? Or is this going to prevent you from skipping? It's going to prevent you from skipping. But if you, you, really if you need to quick. correct, uh, if you if you end up going too steep and then, and then you need to uh, pull out of that, then you might end up skipping. Right, right. So you're going in steep. And that's the thing is that it could be too steep and that you could collapse the vehicle. Because you just have too much, right. much force. Collapse or over overheat. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think they were trying to just test the limits of Starship mm -hmm. with this? This is these are the ones you want to uh, <laughs> blow up because you don't yeah. have any vital equipment that you need to recycle. So it's possible that this was intentional, but I I, I think that they yeah. would have tried to be a little bit closer to a nominal reentry profile, uh, just mm -hmm. because they were still hoping. They, they were, I think they were still hoping to, to see if uh, they could get telemetry from Starlink throughout the whole reentry. You know, that was, that was data that they wanted. And they, um, and they, they, uh, you know, ultimately they wanted that uh, hard splash in the, in the water, right? If they could get to it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I think something went wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously something went wrong, but I, I think that it was that, that tumble. Yeah, and it seemed like it, whatever happened. happened, happened really quickly. You, oh, you, when you, it blew you just, up? You, yeah. You just lost yeah, uh, telemetry lost and, and you didn't yeah. see anything I, that was like, looked like an explosion in the back or anything like that. Not even one frame that would indicate something went wrong. Yeah. yeah, but if you look at if you look at the numbers, uh, the telemetry numbers on the screen at the bottom, you can see that they still have it going. Although they've lost the feed, they've got it going to right. way beyond uh, seventy, and I believe sixty-five uh, kilometers was the last. So that's right. And so they lost down. a little bit of the signal for yeah. the video, and then I think it came yeah. back briefly, and then then that was it, and then it just suddenly yeah. freezes. Yeah. Yes. So right. Okay. That's okay. It. It's still going. It's still going. 65 but that's where that's where it stops at last yeah yeah then at that okay point. so that's not an altitude so that's where i would expect it like, i don't think they they went down too low you know i don't that's not an altitude where i would expect it to break up just on account of uh dynamic pressure and if mm-hmm. you look at the at the rate of deceleration just from from this the you know how, how fast the speed was dropping that's pretty close to a nominal re-entry in terms of uh, the rate of deceleration. I think maybe they, like, for that. Speed, oh, do you think they blew it up? Huh? No. no, I don't. I don't think it was FTS. I think they didn't know what happened to it. So I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think it was dynamic pressure that that caused it to break up. So I don't think it was like too much force from 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 the air that it was encountering. It could have been uh, overheating, because uh, basically for so for for a reentry vehicle that has um, you know reusable uh, thermal protection system, you kind of have a temperature limit. You know, if you're using a blade of TPS, what you want to do is get through that deceleration as quickly as possible to minimize your total heat load, uh, because it's basically just uh, you know ablating your your TPS and doing it slowly is uh, it, it causes more overall ablation, a lower ablation rate, but like more overall ablation. So it's like ripping off a bandaid. You want to get it done as fast as possible, and then it's less painful. If you have reusable TPS, uh, that higher, what you're doing is you're not getting rid of the heat by ablating material. Um, you're you're having to radiate that heat, and that's temperature dependent. So if if, uh, if you need if you're getting more heat uh, into your tiles, then you need to be at a higher temperature to radiate that that away. And your tiles have a temperature limit. So what you really want to do with with this is you want to keep that flux that uh, that that rate of heat transfer per unit area to be relatively stable throughout your reentry and the faster you're going the greater that uh, that heating but also the closer you are to orbital velocity which at this point you know 26,600 700 kilometers you're very close to orbital velocity at that point uh, because you're so close to orbital velocity you don't need very much lift to stay uh, to, to keep a level trajectory or even to, to rise a little bit, right? So uh, if you come in too steep, then then yeah, you could you could end up getting like a full G or two of deceleration at that at that speed, which is which seemed to be what we were seeing. But you don't need it to have the to have the lift that you need for a stable reentry. So but I isn't would that the whole point of using the atmosphere lower... as a braking effect. Yes, it is, um, but it's going to so overload can you your, go your thermal protection system more if yeah, you exactly. do that braking early. If you do do that deceleration, if you do hard deceleration um, at high speed. Hmm. So when you get down to you know uh, fifteen twenty thousand kilometers an hour, then you do need a, approximately that level of deceleration just to just to keep from doing a nosedive through the atmosphere because gravity is pulling you down. Uh, but at that speed, you don't need it, right? So you're you're, you're coming in at this angle, and the, the deeper you dive into the atmosphere, the greater your deceleration, the greater your heat load. Uh, but it, yeah, it may have been too steep of a trajectory, and was it the intended trajectory? That I don't know. It seems like there's yeah. definitely a certain amount of attitude change, and the other is that the heat flux may not have been just on the tiles. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if, if it's happening on the exposed <laughs> surface, then you know, yes. that's there could also be a source of a rud right there. 
Absolutely. Because there's, you know, you, you've got those main tanks are pressurized to getting more heat. So they're getting even more uh, mm -hmm. pressure. I mean, presumably you're still venting through that, but that could also lead to fires because you've got oxygen and methane mm -hmm. in there. How much fuel um, do you think was left in those tanks? That's they a showed point. a little bit. You could, there was some in the graphics. So a couple percent at least. Yeah. I mean, you would ideally, you, if you, if you wanted to increase your chances of preserving the vehicle, you wouldn't want any liquids in there sloshing around. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you would only want whatever is in your header tanks. Maybe. Header tank, and and exactly. since, since they did that uh, propellant transfer, the header tank also would have a fair amount of, uh, you know, empty space for that oxygen to slosh around, which could also make it harder to control the vehicle on the way down. Yeah. I, ideally you would, you would constrain your, all your liquids to where they can't move around very much. Right. Um, and then you would minimize your your uh, gases so that when they heat up during re-entry, uh, you're not getting close to an overpressure event. Uh, and then as your steel is heating up, which is going to heat up to some extent, whether or not you re-enter correctly, but if you you know if you're re-entering at a weird angle, it's going to you know heat up too much. Uh, then it it weakens, right? So your the amount of pressure that those tanks can handle drops so as, as you know if you have pressure rising and your pressure tolerance dropping at some point you're gonna you, you might hit this point where it pops like a balloon that's what they call a double whammy yeah yeah cool but neck that it just it seems uh there's been a crazy lot of um <laughs> progress made um yeah four months what, what? <laughs> yeah i so i think um so the last the last i heard they were looking at um, at nine launches, uh, at least, uh, this year, do you think, um, they've got it, they've, they've achieved enough to turn around, uh, and have another launch within the next month or so? I mean, they've I got like what four, four boosters already in different stages of, uh, yeah. of preparedness and then quite a few starships as well. They, they have the hardware. That, that's what Elon seemed to indicate that they would yeah. almost be ready to go. <laughs> Right after yeah. this one but the question is is the hardware the correct hardware do they need to make yeah. a couple of changes adjustments and then there's the other thing is there's like kind of there's the hardware aspect and then there's the software aspect of learning what they need to do to change with the flight control software and everything else to update that make sure that's working right and then there's kind of the other software which is basically the bureaucratic paperwork <laughs> and we just have no idea where they're <laughs> Um, the FAA is going to say we need uh, another full investigation here because you rutted 400 yeah. meters before you hit hit the water. We need a full accident investigation of what's going on and whether yeah. that you know turns out to be three or four months or whether it's one of those things that goes really quick because it seems that yeah. SpaceX is more or less was leading that. So as much as people were yeah. giving the FAA a hard time on like where is it and where is that FAA license? You know, the FAA license never comes until SpaceX says we want it on this day. And it's it always like, you know, 12 yeah. hours before it's there. So everyone's panicking. Where's the FAA license? And the main thing is that the FAA said, no, we're just waiting on SpaceX to give us a checklist. And then they did that. So at this point, I don't think the FAA is really the holdup. It may be more of mm. uh, SpaceX making sure they cross their T's, dot their I's. Because if they rush one of these things too much, and things really go catastrophically wrong, then the FAA has to step in next time and yeah. say, oh, wait a minute, yeah. you can't police yourself quite that well. You're going to have to go yeah. through. So, so they want to make sure that they, they don't do anything to ruffle feathers the wrong way. And of course, yeah, it's not I like remember the FAA wants to stop them. They're just as excited about this as anyone else. Trust me. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, they need to make sure they're doing their job. Yeah, I remember after the, the first for the first days, you know, there was this huge period of, of waiting and uncertainty, and there was a lot of criticism of the FAA and, and, and the Fish and Wildlife Authority and all of that. And then there was this kind of common understanding that, you know, hang on, it, this is not how it works. It's just that, you know, the FAA is the face of it, but behind the scenes, it's it's uh, <coughs> that actually comes up yes. with, a, with that checklist mm -hmm. of, you know, what needs to be Everything. fixed and how they're going to do it and the timelines, et cetera. So I think um, second uh, flight test, cleared a yeah. lot in the public perception right. also right. and and, and i think if, if you look at it for you know elon, elon will speak his mind <laughs> and yeah. he has yeah. not come out and said like anything like strongly negative about that the faa he says they're doing their job they're doing everything right and for the most part i think they wanted to make sure that they're they were confident with the changes that they made they made sure they had everything there there was like lots of other little testing so 
there's no way they could have done the end of February. You know, it was yeah. not the FAA. It was like SpaceX was really making sure they got everything because you assume you can fix a problem in a week. Then you go in and do it and you begin to realize there's something else it's a little bit harder. So it's, it's sometimes it's, it's very easy to think, ah, this is a super easily solvable problem. And then you find there's something else that becomes a, a hiccup. So it's amazing yeah. that they've been able to, to do it here and that when they finally kind of gave the date that it was there. So I, I had already yeah. kind of heard in the end of February that they were shooting for Pi Day. And it's like, amazingly, it's like, yep, they knew yeah. it. So they were really right on the schedule. So so everyone, would, ever, they already knew weeks in advance that this was going to be the day. And it didn't slip. That, that it itself was a huge, huge sign of progress that they were yes. able to say March 14th and nail March 14th. Yes, yes. Internally, they said March 14th. They nailed March 14th. The only thing that would have made the schedule slip is that the weather was looking bad a few days before. Yeah. And yeah. Then it turned out that it was not perfect conditions, but it was, I guess you had to say good conditions. You know, 30 knots is, or 30, 30 kilometers per hour. That's a pretty stiff wind, but not yeah. enough to stop a vehicle like a Starship. And right. yeah, and it wasn't overly foggy or anything like that. And it seemed like most of the delays in the morning were it's because they had to get the boats out of the way. I, I don't the think boats, it was because they were was waiting. Was something like an eight-minute delay for that? <laughs> yeah, there was, a, there was a couple of, the, but actually it kind of works to the advantage because then it allowed the, the fog to lift a little bit more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the, the the, the engineering value of those videos is enormous yeah. and you don't want to do it in darkness and you don't want to do it in the yeah. fog. So if you can get a well-lit scene, you're going to learn a lot. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so I was just checking, Elon hasn't um, commented yet, but interestingly, Gwen Shotwell has. Oh, okay. And um, there you go. So let's, let's not forget, yeah. this is the 22nd birthday of uh, SpaceX. Yeah. The shrimpers could get out in the nick of time. What are you talking about? The, the shrimp boats? boats? I, th- I think, I think those I the boats that were in the way, boats, yeah. Bubba gum shrimp, you know. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, but this is oh, this payload, is really payload door cycling. So, they, I guess they were happy with the yeah. payload door cycling, yeah. Uh, it was, it was yeah. hard to tell if it opened up all the way or not. So, that's that's the other thing. I've, I've noticed that the initial announcements sometimes uh gloss over like a few imperfections. So, yeah. I've, I've yeah. uh learned not to count too much on the wording of just to wait till the dust settles and they've got all the metrics and yeah got a better sense of what's going on yeah okay heavy boost back and coast and likely a couple engines making main stage during landing burn she's excited so at least a couple engines lit up <laughs> yeah i guess that's one way of sugarcoating it like, yeah. <laughs> at least a couple of the engines work as opposed to a bunch of them didn't <laughs> didn't start off like they're supposed to right clean ship insertion so yeah it seems in coast so uh, they made it in orbit while payload door, bay door cycling. So they looked like it was fully it. open, but maybe they didn't want to fully open it. Maybe they just wanted to verify they could kind of get it up and closed a little bit. Yeah, I couldn't tell. Yeah. Um, the ship entry <laughs> didn't fin- finish the entry, but uh, now to be <laughs> confirmed the that the, that the the prop transfer demo. So there oh, was a okay. transfer demo, but they have to confirm. So they did it. They believe it's done, but I guess they have to confirm it somehow. Yeah, probably. All right, because here it's on this on the SpaceX website, they say it's um, it was uh, successful. Initiating a propellant transfer initiating. demonstration. Yeah. So they initiated it. Did they? Did it? Did they meet all objectives to get paid? Right. That's, that's TBD. And then the yeah. results from these demonstrations will come yeah, after come post-flight yeah. data review is complete. Okay, so right. initially everything looks good. They they they're probably able to say, oh yeah, we uh, were able to empty one of the tanks, but they got to make sure. Well, didn't did it end up in the other tank where you expected it, and what were the yeah. repercussions of that? So they may find that. Um, yeah. Who, oh, who was knows? there a leak? Oh, not necessarily a leak, but um, I, what does it do to the settling? Does does it happily mm. join the rest of the locks that's down there, or does it just start, you know, bubbling up and doing all kinds of? You just, you know, that's probably some of the things you would want to know. Is does it remain settled, mm. or um, could it lead to? Um, so you're you're now increasing the volume, which is a little bit odd. That's different than normal. Normally the volume's going down. Now it's increasing. What's that doing to the um, uh, the high high pressure gas that's in there? So it's going to be getting compressed a little bit. Or, you know, now suddenly you're having this front coming towards it of the it's interface cold. between the two that's yeah. now, now getting colder or something like that. So that there could be all sorts of like nuances in there that they have to look at and understand before they could say it's it's 
it's yeah. successful in the sense that they get <clears throat> data. They get really valuable data, no matter what. Yeah. Although I'm surprised um, Elon hasn't yet um, commented. All he's there's this, this I, I, I think the other surprise is he wasn't Harry evidently Mars. he wasn't there. He was not on site, as far as we can tell. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we didn't see him in any of the videos. He, he right. wasn't at the control center. And someone checked. And they said, "Oh, yeah, his his plane's in Teterboro, New Jersey." So he was probably in New York today because his brother is doing his book tour. So I was like, are you kidding me? His book tour is more important than Chica. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that confidence or what? Well, see, the next time I can't use that as an excuse to go down there when family's in town. It's like, oh, I'm going to go down there. So yeah, I don't care if the family's in town. This is more important. They'll say, yeah, but for Elon, you know, his family was more important for the book cookbook tour than to go see IFT3. So you can't use that excuse. It'd be nice to see a little bit less dependence on. I mean, I think I think we're already seeing less dependence on on Elon uh, yeah. for the Starship program. Uh, and for the past couple of years, it's there's been there's been that shift. Um, yeah, I think as it's he's gotten engaged in other things, and um, it's gone more from ideas to implementation, execution. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, right, and I just want to bring up something it's rather interesting. I was just noticing on, on your timeline there that um, evidently um, uh, President Macron is hosting his own Twitter spaces or his own X spaces. I, I'm not aware of world leaders oh, actually yeah. doing something like that. So that, it's like, wow, that's that's uh, that's rather interesting. That well, Kamala Harris is apparently as well. She has done as well. Oh. Okay, I haven't, I haven't seen some of the others, but to Woman see that for Biden uh, Harris, have, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, go X. <laughs> yes. yeah. The world leaders are deciding to use that to, to reach out there. I know, I know, I know. I mean, very few of them would have the courage media. to do something like that. You know, it's a, like yeah. for, uh, maybe we post something, but actually go there live. Yeah. So then getting back to uh, Starship, um, as far as the fourth flight, Gordon, you asked if, yes. if it might happen in a month. I would be shocked if it, happened any sooner than six weeks and, and even six weeks would be very impressive for me i'd be i'd be happy I'd, I'd be very happy if it took less than three months i think that'd be great progress because mm -hmm. we're basically talking about going okay from, so if you're talking about nine more this this year one a month <laughs> yeah i think I, I think nine nine is aspirational you know if if we see five or six that would be amazing but but also you know you, you've got this increasing cadence and and this is still a flight where there there's a mishap investigation that's going to happen for both vehicles right if we if the next flight manages to do a soft landing for the booster and i mean that that alone would i think enable uh, the define soft landing to, you mean to with happen. the chopsticks no mm -hmm. it's all, uh, in the water oh okay yeah, because so if it's able to light up because, and yeah. and slow down and do a nominal water landing, then it won't be a, mm -hmm. a booster mishap, right? That would, that would be yeah. an intentional. That uh, would be amazing to see the the booster hovering up, uh, but just over above, above the water. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Just yeah, I, I wonder if of... they have any video of it out there, whether there was any ships nearby, or or a tracking mm -hmm. plane or something like that. So that there might be some impressive ones. I think the other thing to point out is that I think. They have made they apply for like nine launch licenses. I think that's the maximum they've been allowed. Remember, there was all this back and forth mm. of how many uh, launches they yeah, can do. Yeah. So I think that they have maybe the permission to do up to nine. Mm. I don't okay. think they can exceed that. Yeah, I think I I saw ten somewhere, but uh, but that would include this one, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So if there's nine more, that that would sort of be, so. Yeah, yeah. It's not like they can go every weekend like they wanted to because they're saying, right. "Wait, yeah. that's still a public beach. People want to, you know, it's in the area. They don't want to hear all the noise." And so they yeah. had to go the back and forth. Now, I think yeah. that's the reason why they, they're thinking of moving a lot of stuff <laughs> to the Cape because. So there's clearly going to be iteration and hardware for both the booster and Starship, and that's going to take its own time. I think you're going to have, yeah, and then and then you're yeah. going to have these the sequence of testing. Um, software updates you're going to have uh, of course a certain amount of time that's going to be spent mm -hmm. from now today onwards to get a look into all the telemetry all the data yeah come up with they the should have figured out what went wrong and yeah. how to fix it that yeah. and uh, implement the, so so you have to figure out what went wrong you have to come up with yeah. how to fix it you have to yeah. implement that fix and then you have yeah. to verify that you you fixed it and you have to 
convince Deal with the bureaucracy regulators as well. that that you yeah. ver- that you fixed and verified your fix, and yeah. then you're and then you're ready to launch, and the, and then there are all the uh, you know the, the there's the checklist for the actual operations of of, yeah. of launch. Uh, but to be fair, I don't think there's some major major hardware fixes we're looking at. Hopefully not. No. Yeah. At and least not for the booster. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's some the internal chip. baffling or something like that. If there's still a little bit of propellant slosh or, or a few things like that, they might be able to do. Right. What I can see is that if they're able to get a couple of really solid launches, very successful under their belt. Yeah. And at that and they point, can... they might want to say, "We're going to sort of fix everything right now." And now, what we want to do is we want to increase the cadence. We want to prove that we mm. can go a little bit faster. And then they would yeah. kind of do those same missions again and again. And then you could see them getting closer together and being a month apart. Yeah. And yeah. So who knows? Maybe at the end of the year, you start to see that, oh, they rapid yeah. fire, do three of them in the, in the fourth quarter. Because, But it's dependent upon them really getting two or three really solid, solid ones. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really good ones where, you know, everyone's got a lot of confidence in there and they can point back that, yes, this fix is what, this change is what fixed that. So we're yeah. really confident going forward because it, if that thing rutted 400 uh, meters in altitude, yeah, yeah, you can't bring it over to the chopsticks. Okay, no, you you've got to find out why that thing is doing that because we don't want to do that over land. So they have to prove yeah. probably at least twice that they can. I I figure that's going to be a made it, that's that's going to be the 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 more difficult challenge mm-hmm. um, with the spaceship yeah. rather than the booster. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Especially because it's also coming challenge. in over land. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, with the booster, oh, yeah, with the Starship, that's going to be even trickier uh, bringing that thing down, and catching the toxic. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I, I read that they're they're expecting at least five hard landings, and and then, uh, or you know, no, sorry, not at least up to five hard landings in the water mm. where they won't even attempt to mm. uh, oh. do a, do a burn, and that's in addition to ruds during reentry and you know soft splashdowns. So that's a while, yeah. Now I, I guess it's they they probably want to be able to recycle the the booster sooner because that that's the one that's the most yeah. expensive. Yeah, yeah. I think the Starship they probably consider it to be a bit more expendable, and it's just easy enough to rebuild them again and again. They've got yeah. that process down. Although I think with the tiles and the door and the, I think yeah. it might be a similar level of complexity, but yeah. not as many but, engines. But yeah, yeah. Easy, the rest of it. And I guess the other thing is is if they are able to actually put pay, useful payload in there. Then yeah. that will help to offset whatever that cost is. Totally, they can get some utility out of it. Yeah, yeah, because they they clearly talk about um, increasing their launch cadence throughout the year. Yeah, um, so they've. I mean, I think if we uh, see two launches uh, in the first half, mm-hmm. right? If we see another one in in about you know two or three months, so before the end of June. <laughs> yeah, and then three or four in the second half of the year that would that would already be a great mm. success in my book if they can take that up to maybe maybe three launches in the first half and maybe uh six or seven in the second half that would be amazing yeah but i think for the most part most of the bureaucracy um or the bureaucratic challenges have been sorted out uh in in the switch from in in the interim between uh, to one and two and now it's just mm going to get incrementally easier yeah, smoother. sure yeah smoother so the, yeah so we went uh, from seven months to four months yeah and now mm-hmm. well you could have as you say within six weeks what's, what's the series seven to four what comes after that <laughs> yeah, I think that like would an be IQ test oh okay a series of two, <laughs> two, what's, two what's, and a half months because yeah. <laughs> it was a little bit under four, kind of four months <laughs> watch it come down yeah. yeah we need at least three yeah, data yeah. points i think yeah anyway, the other thing is that you know that it wasn't just <laughs> It wasn't just that amount of rede- yeah. Well, we yeah, certainly need more data points. But another thing is that it's, it wasn't just that amount of reduction over the course of two flights. It was that amount of reduction over the course of seven months. You know, like it was. Yeah, sure. The, the mm-hmm. time the time between flights is getting shorter, which means there's less time to improve the process between flights. So we might we might not see another factor of two improvement for another sure. two quarters. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. Yeah. But how if, much are you betting that they put a few uh, starlings on the next flight? I would give it a. I'll go for I'll say 50, a 10 to 30. Them from doing it. I'm more like 50%. I think 50%? it's 50 50. Yeah. I think it's they're more likely than not to repeat this and not do a. a um, not do it in an orbital insertion, a full mm-hmm. orbital insertion with a high uh, perigee. I mean, I think they could. 
but I, I, I'd hesitate to go above 30%. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because you're you're right. They have to be confident that they can go up there. So they might have to repeat this flight. It's possible they yeah. maybe they have some sort of dummy payload or maybe just one yeah. or two Starlink satellites that just decide to, to see Toss what it's into like. The to water. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, it's been great talking to you guys. It's uh fantastic. What a day it's been. What a day it's mm -hmm. been. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up your um your Twitter profiles. Uh I, there you go, Twitter profiles, X profiles. I just can't get rid of Twitter, can we? From our common lexicon. All right, that's uh, Scott Walter. He's at Going Ballistic 5. And uh, Ozan Bay is at Pelic Ozan. Guys, it's been great having you. Thank you so much. we got to do this soon. It's yeah. been uh, a while in the making, but we've done it. And it's been a historic opportunity to get together and talk about. Yep, same here. Yep. Looking forward to the next flight. <laughs>